But you know what day it is? What day is it? Oh, I'll take a guess. Go on. Easter. It's Easter day, huh? Happy Easter. Who the hell are you? Easter Bunny. Oh, the Easter. Is that a thing? Oh, for Easter's sake. How much more obvious do you want me to make it? Because I can't text the Easter Bunny, you know? This is... Paul to open. Paul to open. Yes, and what do you do? Chatting. Chatting. Apparently it's digesting my brain. I think you just defined me. Oh, oh. <laughs> cool exit line, though. Here! Come! Hello and happy holidays to everyone out there. What holiday am I speaking of? Well, it's a little unclear, but this being the Saturday before Easter, you might think I'm saying happy Easter to all of you listeners out there, but no, there are other holidays afoot. That's rather, rather confusing, almost like I'm in a dream state. Hey. I need someone to help me out from this. By the way, I'm Pete Paschal. And I'm Sweet Papa Crimbo. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we're here on our Pull to Open Random Adventure. Things have got kind of random, and uh, we did just chant the name of the randomizer in the opening of the show. Uh, my my religious devotion to the randomizer has been has been somewhat renewed by this experience we'll we'll get into why it's so appropriate Praise be to randomness. <laughs> seriously like I, i've got some i've got some very timey wimey things going on here very dreamy oh, weemy no. timey wimey <laughs> i might be going a bit scottish um uh, but yes we are we are here in the dream realm and and pete how did we get here exactly well it's a long story <laughs> Previously on Pull to Open. So we've had a bunch of randomness, as our opening might have implied, but about five stories ago or so, maybe a half dozen, we were at a little tale called Amy's Choice, which yes. is an interesting story in the entire canon of Doctor Who, which we've also recently discussed, because it takes place almost entirely in a dream state. And That's there are right. not that many episodes of Doctor Who that are like this. In fact, in terms of actual dream realities, I think mm-hmm. we do. And That's you know what? what? A few moments. It was also a dream reality within a dream reality, right? It was several layers deep, which True. may become uh, may become important. Uh, I asked it for more dreams. I asked the randomizer for more dreams after that, if you recall. And boy, did it deliver. It did, but it took the long way around, you might say, because (laughs) about three stories ago, we were, well, actually, right after Amy's Choice, we went to the moon base. That's right. That was about four stories ago, so we were in the Troughton era. Then it rocketed us forward to the Tenant era uh, for a little story that is actually a number uh, called 42. And then back, back, back to the Fourth Doctor, but sort of different parts of the Fourth Doctor's run. We were first at the brain of Morbius, uh, a very continuity heavy or establishing story that was, and we took that apart recently. But last time we were at the almost the very end of Tom Baker's run in the beginning of a trilogy and his penultimate story Mm. in the keeper of Traken. A little bit dreamy, a little bit dreamy uh, (laughs) because it was like, at least in terms of, the fashion on Traken. Yeah. Well, I'll yeah. say that both the Brain of Morbius and the Keeper of Traken were kind of all uh, secretly a, a little bit about, about death and resisting it and, and trying to trying to get new life as both uh, Morbius and the Master were, were doing in those stories. True, true. Uh, and I'll also mention that the, between you know when we went to the moon base, uh, there was there was a very there was a very uh, Scottish dream in that one. Uh, the uh, the, uh, right. the the Piper, the the Phantom Piper, the Piper of the, the Phantom McCrimmon Piper. Clan. That's right. So yeah. so we've been we've been we've been talking about dreams. We've been talking about mortality and immortality. And, and it's probably mortality. all leading somewhere, and that <laughs> somewhere <laughs> is, of course. The 2014 Christmas special, Last Christmas. Yes. And you may remember, folks, if you were listening at the end of the last recording, perhaps you're binge listening to Pull to Open, and you just you just heard my reaction to the randomizer taking us to Last Christmas, which was a sort of, oh, like, you know, oh, I really like this one, but oh, that's a bit weird. It's not Christmas. Well, not only 
I'll just give you the headline here. Not only does Last Christmas have more Easter references than any other Doctor Who story, they're mm. being thereby being the most appropriate story that the randomizer could take us to for the Easter holiday. It's done seasonal programming before, and it's doing it again. It, it did it for you know for Remembrance Sunday uh, when it took us to uh, Human Nature and Family of Blood, and and now this is seasonally appropriate. But not just that. I got. I received the day after we recorded the last episode, Pete. I received my last Christmas present <laughs> from, from last Christmas. It no just way. appeared, and it is a time travel book. <laughs> the randomizer is going through your mail. That's right. What the randomizer is going through my mail. It's delaying my mail, apparently, <laughs> retroactively from Christmas. Yeah, my sister sent me, so you created a wormhole. Which is an excellent oh, uh, guide to time travel. Well. And it just showed up like the day after mm-hmm. the last randomizer choice. So I'm genuinely scared of the randomizer now, folks. I'm really, really worried that, that Extremis is going to be the last choice and it's going to turn out that we're not actually living um, in, a, in a random capricious universe. It's, we're, we're living under the, uh, under the uh, overseeing eye of the randomizer. Well, we should all have a healthy fear of the things we worship. <laughs> so I think that's entirely, entirely a good thing. Mm. Uh, please, please don't strike me down, randomizer. <laughs> but yeah, I think this is all because it's coming to a head. It feels climactic to come to last Christmas in a lot of ways. Mm. And of course, the randomizer would pick its favorite doctor. Capaldi, yeah. still, yeah. still the randomizer's favorite doctor, is that right? I don't know. It's I kind know. of like still the randomizer's favorite doctor the way the French Revolution is still the doctor's favorite <laughs> historical period. Well, I was going to so, say, the randomizer's been flirting a bit with Hartnell, and, and we've had quite a few Tom Bakers lately. So, uh, But mm-hmm. Capaldi, probably by some percentage at least, Capaldi is the highest at the moment. Capaldi, yes, I think we did that math recently. It might have mm-hmm. changed in the last couple of months, but yes, uh, Capaldi has been the randomizer's favorite doctor, certainly early on. And we keep coming back and we keep coming back to corkers and not to give away anything away, but <laughs> hmm, mm. <laughs> pretty good. I'll just say this. I thought this one was amazing when it first came out and yes. it was interesting to revisit. Especially and, as uh, we both had stories to revisit from it. You you did a preview mm-hmm. of this for Matchable. I did the Correct. review of this for Matchable. So, so the randomizer is definitely taking it back 10 years to... Uh, to when we were working together there and, and looking at the oh, stories right. we wrote. But yeah. it's funny. This was the, the, the boom. There's another <laughs> randomizer choice. It, this was like the 10th Christmas special. So almost 10 years mm-hmm. of Doctor Who when this came out. And it's been 10 years since then. That's uh, right. So this is kind of like the Equinox in, a, <laughs> in New Who in a lot of ways. Uh, but yeah, we both wrote things. We're going to put links to those in the show notes, uh, assuming I remember. So you can get the whole package here, but now you're going to get our 10 years updated commentary on it. Very, very exciting. To get this kind of commentary early, though, folks, Mm. all you need to do is check us out on YouTube. So if you're listening to us on a podcast app, go ahead and check us out on youtube.com slash pull to open. It's a great place to follow the show. Even if you already listen on a podcast app, that really helps. Plus... You can become a true companion of the podcast. So all you have to do is become a member on YouTube for the low, low price of $7.99. And you will get the podcast a day early before everybody else. And if you're a Viscount, if you contribute at the high level, you can actually appear in the middle of our dreams or will appear in your dreams. Uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. You know, uh, yeah. with, the, with the dream crabs, we'll get together. We'll figure out whose dreams are appearing in. But that's get that's actually what comments, happens. Get into our podcast. That's what we're saying. <laughs> you like counts. I love it. Yes, but at least be, at a true companion level, you could just you know, instead of the equivalent of getting this on Christmas Day, you can uh, you know, pull, instead of pull to open day, you can open it on pull to open Eve. That's right. Hmm. You can open your Christmas present a day early. Uh, I love the sound of opening Christmas presents, you know, the crinkliness and (laughs) all that tearing of paper. Oh, it's just great. Oh, wait, there's another sound I hear. I think it's it's the Humoji Challenge. Oh, nice link. Nice link, sir. Oh, God. Oh, this is the fun part of the show where I describe emojis to Chris and he must 
to absorb those emojis into his mind along with all the other things in this dream state. That's right. And the emoji challenge attaches itself to my face and sucks my brain out <laughs> through a straw. Pretty much. Oh, I like that imagery. And <laughs> You're welcome. Anyway, he's got to guess the Doctor Who title that those emojis correspond to. And we just got a whole bunch of these from a uh, longtime fan, JC17Ace on Patreon. We're going through them one by one. And I've got another one. And these are, like I say, these are a new style of emo- emoji. I'm, I'm just going to. They are very emoji filled. I'm, I'm going <laughs> to stall for time and, and ask you to remind me what it was last week because it was another one of Ace's. Uh, brain teasers yeah. and, and and I got it straight away was it it was it love was. and monsters no that was before this uh, uh, last week was cr- the crusade the crusade okay I did not get that one straight away okay <laughs> you're not ready though. well you're I got I got there in the way. end yes through Hartnell historicals yeah <laughs> all right I, let's see I do feel like these longer ones maybe give you more to work with so I'm optimistic about your chances here they so, do and, that's also and also because now I know he's a classic Who fan. So ah, you can just, there yeah. we go. Mm. And this one has 10 emojis. Oh, God. <laughs> so we're the 10th planet. No, we've done that one. Yeah, that, we, we did that one. That was, that was the infamous episode, but we won't get into that here. All right, starting with the first emoji. Man running. Oh, God. That could be literally every Doctor Who story. Well, is the second emoji a corridor? Second emoji is also a man running. <laughs> oh, okay. The Third next emoji, doctor. Sorry. A woman running. Oh, okay. Fourth emoji. Another woman running. Fifth emoji. Octopus. Oh, jeez. Sixth emoji. Plunger. Okay. Seventh emoji. Boat. Sailboat. Oh. Eighth emoji, skyline, city skyline. Ah. Uh. Ninth emoji, Dracula vampire guy. Oh, thank goodness. Tenth emoji, disco ball. Well, the disco ball I'm a little confused by, but There's everything else. For you. Everything else. Uh, it's gotta be, we went to it recently, it was part of our Dalek trilogy, it's the chase! It is the chase! Hey. 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 Well, see, these yes. ones give you a lot to work with, right? It's they not really bad. do, yeah, yeah. Uh, why why are they like all it. women running from, from the Daleks? That's what I'm curious about. Well, there's two men and two women, it's, it's the Doctor oh, it's, oh, and yeah. Barbara and Susan. That's right. I right? can't see that the the running emoji up uh, up close. Yes, the, there is a difference yeah. in hair length. Yeah, it's because um, the chat is microscopic. <laughs> you just get to observe. But then you got the octopus and the plunger, obviously Daleks. Yes. Sailboat. There's the Mary Celeste. Mary Celeste. Skyline. New That's York. Your New York stopover with Morton Dill. Mm-hmm. <laughs> then obviously the Dracula thing. I, I kind of gave it away. Yeah, can sorry, I just say I want Peter Post to do a travel show in in the Alabama <laughs> accent for Big Finish, and and he can call it you know you can call it like New York Skyline with Morton Dill. Um, <laughs> well, then, yeah. then, then uh, there's the you know the House of Monsters, so that's, yes. that's the Dracula. But the Disco Ball, do you know it? Oh, well, it's got to be. It's the mechanoids. Yes. Mechanoids, yes. Right, exactly. uh, uh, oh, fabulous. Wow. It looks very mechanoidy. I think that's it really does. I, I love doing this show because these these emojis and you know the comments <laughs> that we get on TikTok they really illuminate things. And now I know I can use a disco ball emoji that's with right. other Hoovians to like de- denote. Hey, this is we're talking about mechanoids right now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> wow, so, I love it. Thanks, folks. Thanks, yeah, Ace. Thank you, Ace. And you too can be just like Ace. All you have to do is send us your own emoji in the form of a review. Best place to leave reviews is on Apple Podcasts. You can leave as long as you uh, a review as you want, but you can also leave as short a review as you want. So feel free to just put the emojis in the title, and you can even just put the old school le- <laughs> net speak NT. Yeah. NT. Whoa. <laughs> Wow, in that's the, hot uh, cool. In the uh, the body of it, if you really want to, yeah. that's fine. But we yeah, appreciate any and- comments, um, and you can and you your uh, emoji will then feature on the show. That's uh, right. In this little segment that I love so much, 
Cause... That's right. You too can insert a straw in my brain uh, and <laughs> and uh, drink it up. Drink up that milkshake. Okay, we're taking a side reference there, but also there is a even shorter way to leave a review. If you're on Spotify, you can just re- review the show five stars. But also, if you're watching us right now, hi Spotify, um, you can pull up from the bottom of the screen. See the thing at the bottom of the screen? It's a poll. That's right, it's poll to open. Pull up, and you can review right now. Last Christmas. Yeah, you can review it out of five tangerines. No, you can review it out of uh, our very confusing rating system, which we'll explain later. Um, But we keep those polls open so you can also go back and change the brain of Morbius, uh, Mm -hmm. depending on how you like that brain in a jar story. But we do have some votes right now of the story so far from the brain of Morbius. Right. And, well, just to remind you of our <laughs> ratings, <laughs> you may tell from the fact that I'm reminding you of our ratings, what the ratings, uh, the poll actually says. Uh, Pete, you said this one was a Viscount banger, best of the best. Did. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was almost there with you, but no, I thought it was just a Dalek, just a really good story. A Doctor Who and the people have spoken and the people are once again on my side, Pete. I'm so sorry. Well, just uh, barely. Hold on, hold on. The hey. Dalek did really well. You know, the numbers don't lie. It is the most preferred rating in the poll at roughly 45%. Yep. But the banger did a good showing. It's a close second. Reasonably close. It's getting close to about 30% of the yeah. vote. So, uh, you know, there's a I'm little just, bit of a split decision here. Just going to say, if this was the British House of Commons, the banger would just be wiped out by the first past the post system. I'm sorry. You know, if uh, the banger formed a coalition government <laughs> the fixed point in time and the Ogron, we would be able to dictate to you, sir, what the rules are. So I, that's I, all I'm saying. For some reason, I don't think a fixed point in time party will ever form a coalition with anyone. <laughs> I just can't. <laughs> but the fixed point in time did okay, around 20%. And someone actually yeah. called this an Ogron, which yeah. I don't understand. A little bit of party pooper there. Yeah. Uh, Pondo well, didn't like it, I think. <laughs> so, well, you know, if no, you, yeah, perhaps, perhaps if you are too reminded of of timeless children um, by by Brain and Morbius, you might rate the Snow Ground. But you can rate it whatever you like. Go back to that show, enter your ratings, and that's that's it. We've done the Humoji Challenge. We've done Poll to Good. Open. So now it's time to start talking about Last Christmas. Right? There's no need to summarize it before. We start the show. <laughs> no, uh, no, correct. Just like going to your stocking first before ripping up all those presents under the tree, you need to get through a certain stage before we get to the main event. Uh, yeah, that's right. It's time for TLDW. Too long. Mm-hmm. Didn't watch too long. Doctor Who, the time where we summarize the entire plot of a Doctor Who story in record time. This is a special, though. This is a Christmas special. So it is unusual. And traditionally, and Christmas is all about tradition, isn't it? Oh, yeah. We usually give a little extra time for these specials because their runtime is a little longer. So normally we allocate one minute for every new who episode, but for Christmas specials, we've been giving 75 seconds. Wow. So a whole if, extra if 15 the seconds doing it is willing to accept them. That is, if he wants the 60, we can do that too. Extra 15 seconds. I've got to say, uh, as the doctor would say at this point, anyone for three games of chess. Huh? Um, yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> bring me knitting. I okay. I'm ready. I'm ready to do this. Uh, yes, you are. I, yeah, yep. Yeah, I've got got my face hugger attached to my face. I'm gonna dream crab my way through this. All right, get out from under the mistletoe. It's time for the official <laughs> pull to open summary of last Christmas happening in three, two, one, go. Santa Claus and two elves uh, arrive on Clara's roof and uh, they say that they're not Santa and the elves, but then they're like, oh yeah, we are. And then the doctor shows up, takes Clara to a base at the North Pole where a bunch of people are trying to figure out how to deal with uh, the people in the infirmary who have got who drain crabs, who drain crabs stuck to their face. Uh, but we learn their dream crabs when the doctor and Clara show up and the crabs attack all of them and they go into a dream and Santa shows up and saves them. Uh, but then after that, they're like, they realize they were in a dream. Clara 
Laura goes into her own dream where Danny Pink's still alive. Uh, the doctor has to go and attach a dream crab to his face to save her. But then they're all still in the dream. They all have the same ice cream headache. The dream crabs are dissolving all of their brains. Uh, so the doctor figures that out. They all wake up. But then, whoa, whoa, what? The, the doctor's going back to the time. He realized there were only four manuals that they used to figure out uh, whether they were dreaming because they have different words in them. Um, so it's it's still a dream. And then they have to, the dream crabs are multiplying. Oh, no, but what's happening? Here's, here's Santa Claus to get them out of it. Second. And they they deliver they deliver everyone to their their homes by they they disappear on Santa's sleigh and then uh, and then Clara's old uh, when when the doctor finds her but it's okay that that was a dream too and then they go off in the TARDIS again time nice nailed it great job Craig is wild all I would have added is the tangerine at the end. If I'd known you were going to be this successful, I'd arrange for carolers to be right outside your door <laughs> right now. That's awesome. And then I would Good have job. said, do I get a second chance? I never get second <laughs> chances. I don't know who to thank. Uh, and I get Sweet. to thank Santa. Sweet Papa Crimbo. That's right. Well, there's, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not bad because it's a bit of, of windy. And I, I'm, mm. I really admire that you didn't do the tempting thing of just simplifying everything and just revealing the entire plot from the get-go so that you could just list off things. Cause you, you basically followed the narrative and what's not, a, what is a dream and what isn't a dream. And you didn't go down the rabbit hole of the Danny pink dream, which is, which is something we'll talk about at length here because yeah. it's the heart of the story. But from the plot standpoint, it's, it's like, get it over with. So that, that was a very smart choice. I, I also failed to mention whether whether Santa was actually real or not. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> but I think in the spirit of this of the show, like we we should just start right here because of course this was playing with fire, right? And we recognized this at the time, like Moffat mm -hmm. doing a Santa story at Christmas with every kid in the UK watching. Like, were they just going to create a nation of unbelievers? You know mm -hmm. what? What horrible future would have been wrought from this this country where nobody believes in Santa anymore? And the interesting thing about last Christmas, watching it again, is not just all the references to Easter uh, and the Easter Bunny, but the fact that it does actually f lean into the ways in which Santa is real. A hundred percent ourselves, yeah. right? I mean, the the best line I think you you and I loved it both uh, was where. Shona, who is the uh, you know the, the dreamer who is the most skeptical of Santa, who has this wonderful thing about you know where Santa has three three words, My Little Pony, and Shona's like, "I'll cut you, Santa." Um, <laughs> love way, that bit. The first and only My Little Pony reference in Doctor Who, right. I believe. Yes, we is, have a My Little Pony bingo. <laughs> well, I love that there, there is a reference because I, I'm not sure if Moffat put this in in a knowing way, but there mm -hmm. is a. Lot, there's a lot of Doctor Who references in My Little Pony. Like there is crossover between what you might call the bronies. Yes, and I, I'm, I'm kind of ashamed I even know this that that's what they're <laughs> called, which are sort of mature adult fans of My Little Pony. Yes, uh, and Doctor Who fans, and you know, there's a, there's a Doctor Who's in My Little Pony and all this. So it's it's kind of nice to show maybe winked back just one time. Oh, my little pony. It's fabulous. But anyway, Shona comes out with what Santa says is the perfect description of Santa Claus, which is a, a collective dream that is trying to save you. Right. And there is a very real sense in which that's real. Right, yeah, that is true, yeah. and you sort of realize this watching last Christmas, and and you know, you, uh, Clara has this moment where she realizes that she does believe in Santa because the Doctor has shown up, and time and again throughout last Christmas, this is something else I'd forgotten. Um, the the comparison is made between Santa and the Doctor, right? <laughs> both being as real as each other, and that wonderful moment where. Uh, you know, Santa's like, of course I'm, not, of course I'm a dream, you know. And we, it, look, it, come on, it's Christmas Day, and you get Santa in a big red outfit, and one of the elves is like, yeah, you know, get a bunch of magical elves, and you get a magician in the box, you know, and you get a time traveling magician, and he's in a box that's smaller on the inside, and and the doctor's like, whoa, 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 and we as an audience are also like, whoa, 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 no, no, the doctor's real. No, I, I don't know what you're talking about. So you almost get that sort of panicked, childlike response of like, no, what are you talking about? The doctor's real. Of course he is. Oh, yeah, it's so, genius. I, yeah. I, 
Yeah, I, I love I love all that. And and like Nick Frost is just brilliant oh. in terms of his delivery. So I'm not sure if you actually said the line, but he goes to Shauna, Shauna, sweetheart, I'm Santa Claus. I think you've just defined me. Like, yes. And you, you need kind of a British Santa to do that. And one with sort of the wry sense of humor that that he has. And he just nails that line. He nails like all of his lines, really. <laughs> And here's the thing about Nick Frost. I mean, I I read the Doctor Who magazine interview with him in which he said that basically this is a bit of an East End Santa. He's a bit of a gangster. He's a bit bit rough. And Mm. you could sort of hear that in his performance, but also he's just so sweet. Nick Frost cannot not be sweet. So, like, you don't really get that. So even though he's trying to put this rough edge into his performance, even though he's really kind of mean in in, in, uh, imitating the Doctor's accent, or as the Doctor might say, it's a bit dreamy weemy. Um, (laughs) Like, that's mean. There's (laughs) there's a lot of great dialogue here. Again, I think this is a great example, uh, to get a little meta with it, of when Moffat has time to write, and sit down. And again, I think mm-hmm. a lot of these Christmas specials exemplify this because a lot of the time when you're making the season, there's the demands of a weekly schedule. And it's just, it's really difficult, even in today's Doctor Who, to do everything you want. And a lot of stuff ends up uh, unrealized. But yeah. for these Christmas specials, like they really do seem to have time to get things right. Because I'm also going to praise like the technical production of this which does mm-hmm. a lot of good horror stuff and a lot of good christmas stuff and sort of mixes them together but also moffat like i like i was saying like i you know i was just criticizing him again uh, because we that was our <laughs> our podcast about <laughs> canon and he, yeah. it's kind of an easy target he's, he's a pretty uh. easy one because he gets lazy with it sometimes and he just does stuff but here he really earns it he really earns all of those emotional beats he really does the work of figuring out how to weave Santa into the Doctor Who universe and have that make sense on some level. Because if yes. you read my preview in Mashable, it, it really reflects what I think a lot of people were saying at the time, which is mm-hmm. that this seems silly even for Doctor Who. Yes. You know, Doctor Who, even, even and Moffat was fairly new at the time. So his sort of extra silly fantasy version what hadn't been. Actually, he wasn't new at the time. Sorry. He, he was new with Capaldi at the time. So never mind. Yeah. But yeah, he, yeah. He was new, new again. <laughs> yeah, new, renewed, I guess. Um, <laughs> but the like he 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 really earns all of his beats in this one, and he mm. really has time to get some good dialogue and all those. And so, like, I was really struck by, you know, what you were just saying about Nick Frost and all those lines. I mean, the dreamy weemy. He's getting so self aware about the show itself, right? Yes, and the 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 timey wiminess, which is his line from Blake. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like like he invented it. I know, like, and, and he's he's, he's dragged it, he's dragged it through the mud ever since, <laughs> <You Yeah. know? laughs> and yeah. poked fun at himself, and had John Hurt poking fun at him for that line, uh, you know, ever ever since. So yeah, I love that he both pokes fun at himself and doesn't stop doing it with the dreamy weemy bit from from Santa. So good, but yeah, I think you got to remember the context of this. It's season eight. We've just had a uh, robot robot of sherwood in this season and we we've been right. there on the show we can we can safely discuss that without the randomizer sending us there thank goodness because that's you know that arguably doesn't work as well as this and you sort of you go in thinking oh they're, they're gonna give santa the robot of sherwood treatment and it's all gonna be about does he exist well sort of yes but also just just the the alchemy in this script it's like i i feel like if moffat sold his soul for any script to the devil it was for this one because mm-hmm. it shouldn't work the way he's being allowed to kind of wake up the audience on christmas we've talked about this before he said yeah. it in the interview with you we talked yeah. about it recently when we did a christmas carol and how interesting that we did that one first at christmas because i think that one is better at christmas whereas this one you can sort of do anytime mm-hmm. um but anyway, it shouldn't work. Like all that loudness in the first twenty minutes. All the, f- the first twenty minutes is like all the stuff that I hated, and I, I said this in my review. Like if you just <laughs> stuck around for twenty minutes and then pieced out, you'd be like this. You'd think this was a completely different Christmas special right. because you have stuff like you know the the car noise that the reindeer makes. You have the elves oh, saying, yeah. "Badass definitely, Santa I, is giving me the point. feels." Yeah. yeah, and there's a lot of bit, and, and there's "Merry Christmas, Everybody," which I don't. I understand is not that popular christmas song in the u.s Mm -hmm. not that many people know it over here 
But in the UK, that song by Slade, so here it is, Merry Christmas, um, is practically the national anthem. Wow, it's, it's basically like the Mariah Carey yes. <laughs> anthem just you, over there. You hear it coming out of every pub. You can imagine yourself in every pub where everyone is lifting their beer at the same moment on that line, so here it is, Merry Christmas. Like, it's a song designed to be shouted in pubs. Uh, mm. And it okay. is. And so the fact that that totally plays... over my head. Where is that? Like, when, <laughs> is that playing when Santa comes in, when he bursts in? Is that the... No, that is no. what Shona chooses when she's going through the infirmary. Oh! Oh, that's yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, got you. Yes, and she dances along to it. So there's nothing more screaming in the face of a drunk Christmas audience than someone dancing on screen to "Merry Christmas, Everybody" by Slade. Oh um, wow! Yeah, nice. And should we get into Shona now? Because uh, as we both know, she might have been the next companion. She might have been. Yeah. So obviously, the back story to this is that Jenna Coleman was on the fence on whether she wanted to do series nine or not. She'd already Mm -hmm. been for half of season seven, series seven Mm -hmm. and series eight. And she was like, do I want to stay? Do I want to go? So basically Moffat had to write it so that it could go either way. Right. And the dream crab stuff allows him that because all he has to do is remove that last that's dream within a dream layer. Mm. And then she's out and she's just old or whatever. And we can, we'll take that apart later. But the, the point is um, they had to sort of start thinking about who the next companion would be. Mm. And so they cast Faye Marse. I guess I don't know her, but she played Shona. Is it Shona or Shauna? Uh, Shona, I think. Yes. Yeah. Let's go with Shona. Yeah. And th- I like her performance a lot, actually, on second viewing. So I mm. probably haven't seen this either since the first broadcast, or I might have seen the it one more time, maybe at a Christmas, maybe a Christmas around then. But uh, I, I really appreciate her performance this time, because when you think about what she turns out to be, which is someone who works in a shop, that's what she acts like. You know, all of her stuff, whether it's the dancing or just her general dialogue and, you know, she's supposed to be this scientist in a base, but she's, she's clearly a bit more on the chav side of things. Yes. Uh, if you take my meeting. But so, but she's also but she's a scientist underneath it. And that's that's why like this why this is get gets wonderfully educational in a way. Like it's still it's not just reaching back into Doctor Who history for the base under siege classic setup, which by the right. way, another reason why we've come here after the moon base, mm-hmm. after we see the classic base on siege starring Dretton. Here's a base oh, right. on siege starring his son, uh his second son. So um you know, so so it's it's all of that stuff, and then yeah, she she comes in with the questions. She's the one who's questioning Santa right. in the way that uh, the Doctor questions uh, Robin Hood. Uh, she takes most of it on herself. She's there with the notebook. Um, so I love that fact. I also love that the yeah. the woman who got the si- the uh, micro uh, the uh, microscope for Christmas. Um, was also uh, it, like she sells perfume. She's a perfume manager, but they're all scientists mm-hmm. in their sleep, and I love right, that right. message that we can all be that, you know, despite what our what our uh, what our day job is. Uh, but How I want to think say, fans would have liked if Shona s- kept on, and basically <laughs> Moffat would have had another blonde shop girl <laughs> as the doctor's companion well he has but, said since that that a lot of what she was ended up in bill Potts. Mm, right uh, and that the idea was you know the key word was irreverent you know that this would be a, a companion would be way more irreverent way more skeptical and the way that bill Potts keeps asking the doctor questions in season 10 that questions mm. like you know why, why are the chairs so far away from the console uh stuff like right. that like you can totally imagine that coming out of shona's mouth uh by the way if you're if you're wondering where else you've seen Faye marseille i bet the most uh most of our listeners will either say the the one turn in black mirror that she did or uh game of thrones she was the waif mm. do you remember the waif from the the seasons that uh doctor who alum uh, Maisie williams was training in uh, in Bravos, 
she had, she has the big stick. I don't remember those scenes <laughs> at all because I've never seen any of the oh, scenes in Game hey, of Thrones. So hey, okay. There it is. But I love it. It makes that extra special. The fact that she on on her list when Shona wakes up on her list is what, have a Thrones marathon. Oh, so right, she's right, right. going to okay. watch herself, Smart. which is perhaps the most self-referential Doctor Who has been since it put a Doctor Who ad on the side of a bus in, in the forest been, of the night. Uh, that must have been for her Boxing Day list, because <laughs> yeah. otherwise it wouldn't have been Alien. It would have been the <laughs> Westeros or whatever. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it does. I mean, I, I think that's the reason why it's on the list. But on the, the first thing on the list is Alien. The second thing on the list is the thing from another world, not the right, thing. Right. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. We've d- we've talked about the thing before, right? You've you mentioned it was sure, of either course. one of your mav- famous favorite movies or your favorite yeah, movie of all time. I think it's I think it's the greatest horror movie ever made. Okay. Yes. So because of that, I because you said that, and because it was mentioned in this, I watched half the thing last night. I could half get half. Yes. I got halfway through it. I just get, got very sleepy. And I thought, oh. great. Now I'm, now I'm going into the thing dreams. Uh, this, this is actually perfect for the, for the podcast. Unfortunately, I did not dream about being at an Antarctic base. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I got as far as like all that, all that body horror with the dog. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Well, it basically got to where the, where it busts out of, or tries to bust out yes. of the cage because the dog yes. is not a dog, obviously. Yeah, um, and then the, the scientist in that figures out that it's it cells are, are, are moving fast. They figured out that it's also probably going to wow, be a bunch you're, of you're humans. Just getting into it. Yeah. That, you know, obviously that's the big <laughs> kickoff of everything. So, okay, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it didn't produce any dreams. Polar base. Um, but I, I do love that list, by the way, not just for the fact that it sort of retroactively explains why they're doing all these homages, <laughs> but also it has that one line, forgive Dave, which mm, just draws yeah. in Shona's character so well. And that, mm. that is what Moffat is the absolute master at is in a single line or two or a single, like, you know, in this case, just a piece of paper over on camera, you draw in the gaps and you get so much of Shona's life from that. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty genius. Um, I and, think and you really get more than you get the, the lives of the others. Like we don't even see the the professor, uh, Mister right. Troughton, uh, dying, which is uh, because he's you know he's a bit me too. Well, you see him drawn into the screen, mm. and they need to make the peril real. Like someone had to die. Yeah, um, this can couldn't really be in everybody lives episode. I don't think as much as you kind of might be tempted to do that for a Christmas story. So they had to sort of show that these dream crabs, yes, you can sort of will them off you and then they disintegrate, which by the way is a little too convenient. I'll admit like mm. they just fall off and then they just die and they die in the most obvious way. And again, like, again, this is him doing the loudness of Christmas and just don't yeah. think about it. Don't wonder if they're going to, mm-hmm. you know, come back, no, they're just, they're just going to disintegrate. And that's fine. Again, that's just expediency and making sure he has time to play the beats he wants to, to earn all the payoffs he needs to create. And the, the, and he, he basically spends his, uh, energy in the place where it absolutely should be, which is that dream state that Clara yeah. comes in. And her essentially her last Christmas with Danny Pink, which is mm. so so sad, and it really tucks tucks at your heart, flings tucks at your arms. Story, yeah, heart yes, story. it it, it tugs <laughs> at no, uh, many so many sad. parts. Yes, because yeah. uh, you know who wouldn't want to spend a last Christmas with Danny Pink? And I really like the the powerfulness of the message. Not really the message. It's more. Uh, I wouldn't call it a trope either, but it is something that a lot of sci-fi does when they do dream states where people question reality Hmm. and there's sort of in some vulnerable characters, a dilemma. Well, I could just stay in the unreality and everything's easier and I'd be happier. And it's this temptation of the drug essentially. And uh, it's, it happens. And I really like it when it's used properly. Uh, And it can be overused, I'll admit, but I mean, when your character is in such a vulnerable state like Clara is, and you want to really emphasize the bond that they have with someone who probably isn't real, 
um, it's it's a good little device, and they kind of use it pretty effectively here. I would argue. I think they I really, really like do. It. And I think the thing is that the, the key thing is that then they're they're where the audience is at. It's like the audience mm-hmm. knows this is a dream. So right from the start, Clara knows it's a dream, and that's the scary thing because, as you say, yeah, it is like a drug. The question is not will she realize it's a dream. The question is will she will she be able to kick that drug in time. Yeah to get out and that leads us to the hands down scariest moment in this episode and Mm -hmm. kind of a contender for i would say scariest moment in doctor who and again it's one of those things where despite all the cgi money that doctor who has in a new era a thing you could have done in classic who right the blackboard Yes. The blackboard okay. becoming a whole corridor of blackboards. The blackboard becoming Clara, going from Clara dreaming to dying. Well, and I love that it goes from dreaming to dying when she tries to mm. wipe it away. Like, yes. It's, it, it's such a terrifying sort of thing because it's giving you the familiar and the tactile, and it, it's layering on this unreality, this reminder that, oh, no, there's, there's much more afoot here. And she's in serious this is not real you know to her yeah. and then it makes us want put her put ourselves in her mind again to your point like oh get out of there and resist mm. it and then she she kind of doesn't you know she's just like i'm just gonna forget about this and you're just like oh clara no no you know, you're just right yeah. There. yeah and suddenly you're really out of the christmasy thing right suddenly yeah. you're like Maybe this is too scary for the kids. Like yeah. <laughs> the whole corridor. By the way, sidebar, I do hope that in the last 10 years, some Doctor Who fan somewhere has, on Christmas morning, installed a whole bunch of uh, blackboards uh, in, in in their corridor. So their family wakes up to an entire corridor full of twinkly lights and blackboards that just say dying over and over again. That would just be the perfect Christmas gift. Uh, you know, if you want to do that next Christmas, uh, folks, uh, you're welcome to the idea. I'm, I'm sure the family say, will love it. <laughs> one more thing about this, which is that the you compare this to a very similar scene, arguably just as creepy, but I would say not as creepy, mm. uh, which was in The Doctor's Wife. And so when mm. Amy and Rory are you know, sort of wandered around uh, being taunted and tormented by House in the TARDIS, there's a bit where... Amy essentially encounters a corridor filled with all these things that are even more scary, like kill yes, Amy, die Amy. Yes. And it's, it's, it's viscerally scary, but it doesn't have the resonance that this does. I think this is scarier and hits you harder because of Clara's dilemma. And because you, you truly believe like she might choose to stay in this dream state. Yeah. And in other words, sort of the emotional stakes are much more real here. And, I'd also, yeah, yeah I'd, I'd argue something that, that gets the really surprisingly existential nature of this story, which is the choice of the word dying rather mm. than dead. Now, Doctor Who would often choose dead, and it does in the moment yeah, where they're reading the manuals the second time, very, very, very dead. And, and it kind of works there. But there's something scarier about dying about the choice right. of dying, the repetition of dying. And and I think that that plays into the fact that we are all dying. We like yeah. that is that is just an existential philosophical fact. It was interesting. I, was, I just after I watched last Christmas, I watched the latest uh, episode uh, where I'm working my way through Capote and the Swans, highly recommended. Uh, okay. Nothing to do with Doctor Who, but there's a wonderful episode where Truman Capote and James Baldwin hang out. And Baldwin kind of, you know, gives gives Capote a, a come to Jesus moment or a come to Santa if you will, where he's like <laughs> we're we're all dying. Like we all start off dying on day 1. And ha- it's question of how do you deal with that what do you do in the interim and i'm like wow you know coupled that with the with the dying message of doctor who and yeah it's ultimately about that and that's why it sort of it makes such a wonderful trilogy with brain and morbius uh and with uh, keeper of Trakan because they're both about you know people time lords trying to prolong their lives um and uh, yeah, it also kind of makes a, a nice trilogy in in sequential order as well, right? With Dark Water, Death in Heaven being all about death and the death of Danny Pink and the Three Word Foundation and all of that. And then afterwards, Magician's right. Apprentice uh, slash Witches Familiar is all about you know the Doctor thinking he's going to die and he's got his confession dial and Davros oh, yeah. says he's going to die, right? So this uh, you could almost call it Moffat's Mortality trilogy. 
right? Yeah, uh, I know. Definitely a trilogy of stories. It's right in there, and I you might almost say that this is Moffat at the height of his Doctor Who powers. Like he's taken all the learnings from the Matt Smith era, and like he's he's really transmuted it here. Yeah, and he's really you know like nailing the dialogue and sort of the the character moments. Like I really love the whole thing with that Christmas scene with Danny Pink. One, it's great mm. they kept it a surprise, yeah. so they made sure um, that they didn't credit. Uh, oh God, what's the actor's name? Samuel Anderson, Sam Anderson yes. uh, in, in all the promotional material. So he just kind of comes out. It's like, Oh my God, Danny. And they're like, of course it's Danny. Yes. Um, but they, they have that wonderful, of- he's in soft focus at first, right? It's just, she right. sees Santa walk- walking towards him. Well, that's also another one of the things I think is great about this, all the technical decisions they make. Mm. Uh, and again, there's such attention to detail. So this is the one sort of dream within this dream world of the episode that is obviously a dream. And they make it that way. All the soft focus, all the presence, all this stuff. Um, so so you're constantly getting bombarded with visual uh, elements of the unreality of it, um, mm. which is a smart thing. But also just the dialogue between her and Danny. Obviously, they've had a whole season, um, but this is some of their best stuff and sort of really hits why these people are so in sync they're together they're truly in love and just that that loving banter Uh, she talks about her presence and then you see stuff related to all those presents later when they're on the couch and you see oh i didn't see that all that there's a cat carrier is there there's a reference to the indian orient express which i didn't even know was a train yeah i think so um I, you know, <laughs> there must be, but it well, is. Yeah. It's permission to own a cat tickets to the Indian order to express. And what was, what was the other, there's a bunch of gifts that he gives up, but sorry. Go yeah. No, but I was just going to say that the, the way they end the scene, it's some of Moffat's best dialogue between the two of them, where he goes mm. first to the doctor. I didn't die saving the world. I died saving her. The rest, the rest of you, of you got just lucky. got lucky. I mean, oh, mm. just hits you. And then, everything they sort of say goodbye to each other and he tell gives her permission to miss him but only five minutes a day oh. like holy tearjerker i'm just gonna shout yes. out to doctor who show our buddy dave kitchen over there and and rob because they just they just did an episode on tearjerkers the yeah. top tear jerking moments in doctor who um, they mentioned this? you know maybe they i don't know i i don't think they did uh <laughs> but it is nice. i don't know if it'd be in my top five but it's definitely probably in my top 10 of like oh just, just I, I got to say, I think it would be in my top one. I, it managed to jerk yeah. some tears out of me on this rewatch, and I must have watched this five or six times now. But yeah, mm-hmm. that moment, like embedded in Last Christmas, is not only the reason for celebrating Christmas, because we, quite frankly, and to put it more bluntly than the show does, everyone at your Christmas table might be dead next year. Uh, mm-hmm. It's entirely possible. We don't know. So treat it as if it is your last Christmas. Uh, but then there's also instructions for grief, for like how to process grief. Yeah. Miss me for five minutes a day, and they'd better be really good minutes. I want my five yeah. minutes. And then just get get the hell on with it. I mean, isn't that what we all want for ourselves mm-hmm. after we're gone? Like, you know, and if you're, if you're out there, if you're missing someone, I, I want to imagine you, them saying that to you, right? Miss me really good and hard for five minutes a day, but then get on with mm-hmm. it because that's what they'll want. Love it. My God, yeah. talk about educational. Yeah, my, you know, this is this is why Moffat's era and his writing is praised so often. Mm. Um, he's he's like you say. I think he's really at the top of his game here. Uh, and to really do that using in an episode would, would, about Santa Claus. I mean, yeah, my God, right? well, this is the thing. Like he, I would say he's kind of leveraging what you might call political capital here mm. because of the goodwill he's bought. He's bought from fans and. The, just the creative community. So it's like, again, the silliness mishandled it could have been a career ruiner in a yeah. sense, right? Uh, and But because he, he's Stephen Moffat, we all sort of give it a chance and he sort of really nails it. Now, like, I would just contrast that a little bit, not because I, I can't speak to the material because I never checked it out, but there, Doctor Who did something for the 60th called Doomsday and it wasn't on mm. screen, but it was this thing across comics and yeah online games. and other experiences mm-hmm. games and stuff and it was more of a commercial thing but it just I, frankly it just looked really dumb and i don't want to pile on because i know a lot of people did but you know when you don't have someone behind it uh, in that sort of creative force with that vision that you trust 
like why would i check that out it just looks yeah. stupid right whereas here it's like well, okay doctor who plus santa looks stupid but hey Stephen moffat's writing it i'm in i'm gonna check it out and another way that like the, this really shouldn't work is the way in which it repeats uh, a lot of season eight we've mentioned that the robot of sherwood thing it's sort of a repeat of like oh we're we're you know, talking about whether this mythological figure is real or not. Um, but it, there, there's the uh, Indian Express reference. By the way, the third gift was a painting we saw in Paris. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then there's also, like, it's a reference to listen because it's that question of, like, you don't pay, if you don't pay attention to the dream crabs, you can get through. So that sort of, uh, is, is oh, that yeah. listen, listen, listen? Like, it, it just, it, that goes it for sure. And for then sure. Yeah. you have the thing that really screwed Moffat up that he kind of apologized for, which I guess is a bit of a mistake, but uh, but works in canon. The the fact that the Doctor turns out, after all of this, spoiler alert, to have the dream cab on his face uh, by a volcano. Right, yeah. That looks exactly like, because it is exactly like, the same set as, as uh, Dark Water, where right, yeah. it's the point where, where Clara is throwing the TARDIS keys into the volcano. Now, I had to go back and watch Dark Water again, even though we did it for the show, to realize that the Dark Water moment is also itself a dream. Right, exactly. So it's actually a wonderful meta reference that that is a real place now. <laughs> but yeah. only only in last christmas is it real yeah because it's not real at first because he wakes up twice there yes. but he wakes up again in the same spot yeah and i i never really quite got what the deal is with the dream crabs and how they ended up on everyone and i think mm. there's kind of enough here um, and it's not really important because obviously it's not really about that. That's more plot stuff. But for those that care, and we should care because we should yeah. care about consistency in canon, everyone. Uh, <laughs> we should well, see like, last week for reasons. I, yeah, because there's there's a there's a couple things I want to mention. One, yeah. the doctor mentions that oh, we're not sure if the dream crabs are even working across time, right? They, we could be in different mm-hmm. times, and that seemed that was kind of to me a bit a step too far. I was like, wait a minute, come on, and. I think that was left in to potentially set up the end where it's 62 years later. Mm. One, I don't think that was necessary because who's to say everyone at the end isn't in 2076 or whatever the year would be, yeah. right? Like why, why, yeah, why Clara's, not? Clara's own future. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Um, and it is, you do get that one line about everyone else was collateral damage. Mm-hmm. That explains the dream cabs that they, they found the right. doctor first. They went back through his memories to find Clara. Well, now how do they do this physically in space? Uh, is it some sort of like psychic pollen thing where it's just stuck in the TARDIS? And some yeah. dream crab ra- babies, but like collateral damage, that one line is enough for you to head cannon it, right? right? It's enough for you to exactly. slip a straw into your own brain um, <laughs> and come up with a reason. Uh, well, that's that's another which, thing where, Yo, go ahead. <laughs> I know you have this issue uh, yeah. I, uh, about Absolutely. the dream crabs. Well, the doctor the... describes so so mm-hmm. viscerally like what they do, mm-hmm. like that it forces a thing into your temple, and of course they'd have to. They essentially force a straw to suck out your brain, and he's very clear it's physical. Mm. And when they rip off the crabs, there isn't so much as a as a as a, a little peck. On there, right? Which right. is a little like, wait a minute, you know, and that <laughs> I think that would be the giveaway that it's yeah. a dream that there's no wound, um, and you think that would be the thing at the very end where they finally get them off. Everybody has at least a little red dot right there in the temple. Um, that that I, I I know it's a detail, right? Yeah, but, but again, yeah. I think the devil is kind of in the details on some of these things. So I mean, that does sort of you know I can see why Moffat did it, and it's the same reason why he did the stupid reset button with Matt Smith at the end of Time of the Doctor, right? It's uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> the fact that you do, you don't want this sort of lovely story to end with little bits of dro- blood dripping down everyone's head. Like, <laughs> it doesn't have to be dripping. It'd just be like yeah. a little thing. Maybe like you could argue it was so tiny and mm. all it is, it ends up like, um, you know, uh, clotting, like almost immediately. Yeah. So, so that it would just be a dot, but no, I take your point. You don't really even want to even worry about that. And people will fill in the blank. Yeah. Um, they're they're going to head cannon. <laughs> with oh. the dream crabs. 
Get into your head. Uh, I'm going to say my head cannon is it's like acupuncture, and it just like the needle uh, is so tiny that there's not even any blood. Let's do that. Yeah, let's do that. That, <laughs> it completely answers that question. But you know yes. what? There are a few other questions that we need to answer, and those are, of course, the four questions to Doomsday. First question: Why did the randomizer take us here? Oh my goodness. So there are in last Christmas, seven references to Easter, seven, <laughs> which is, and I've been to count them because you know, you know, Dr. Who fans, you, you like to get nerdy with this. There are two references to Easter in planet of the dead, uh, which actually takes place at Easter. Mm, uh, yeah. There is one reference in the 11th hour which also takes place at Easter. And that reference uh, is when Amy is uh, praying. Um, is she even praying? She's actually praying to Santa or something, which makes it even more appropriate. But anyway, that, that scene is repeated in the Big Bang. Uh, there's one in The Girl Who Waited. Where <laughs> How many of these are there? Just so people know. <laughs> one one more. One, one more. more. It's going to be a sting in the tail. It's going to be a dream crab. Uh, but yeah, the girl who waited, the old, the older Amy is like, oh, I could just come by for Christmas and maybe Easter. Um, <laughs> and then the church on Ruby Road oh, has one go. Easter reference. And who makes the reference? It's Mrs. Flood. Oh, okay. That's right. Oh, she's a dream crab. Yes. So I wanted to bring it right up to date with the very latest Doctor Who thing that we're wondering about also has an Easter connection. So mm -hmm. there you go. Uh, now, I'm not counting the Easter, the mention of Easter eggs in Blink or Easter Island, which is in both Impossible Astronaut and Time of the Doctor. So right, right, right. there we go. There's a complete rundown of Easter and Doctor Who. Nice. Uh, well, yeah. This is the most Easter heavy episode um <laughs> apart from all the stuff we've already mentioned i think the clearest one is amy's choice that has the, th mm. the through line between the two dream episodes um i'm thinking the randomizer might have a favorite showrunner in addition to a favorite doctor and <laughs> yeah so it took us just before christmas to a christmas carol which was matt smith's first christmas special and, and now it's taking us and moffat's first and now this is Capaldi's first Christmas special. And, uh, and we've you know, also been to the Doctor, the Widow, and the Wardrobe. So it's mm -hmm. another Moffat Christmas special. Yeah. So I think, uh, well, we might be in for a little more of this era in our future, but I'd <laughs> yeah. also like to do a little twice upon a time. Yeah. Right. Or, it. or, uh, Time of the Doctor. I'm ready to revisit that. Yeah. Um, but I think it is important that the randomizer knows the value of this episode. And it knows that if it gi had given us last Christmas at Christmas, we mm -hmm. would have just not known whether we're, you know, viewing it through tinsel covered spectacles you know right, right. Uh, this way we can judge it without any seasonal sentimentality um so yeah it loves moffat it loves christmas it loves capaldi and I, I i'm amazed it held back so long yeah cool all right so now we're moving on to the second question which of course is what if the evil plot had succeeded <laughs> well so the, the Dream Crab's evil plot, presuming that it is theirs, but who, who says theirs? I mean, they're just trying to live, man. <laughs> just trying to spread themselves throughout the universe, just like all of us. Um, but anyway, it's, it succeeds if the Doctor gets sucked into the dream, right? Yeah. That's what you need. You need the, the prime mover of reminding everyone that they're asleep. And what, by the way, I just love that it's embedded in the dialogue early one, on where one of the p people on the base says, you know, it feels, it feels like a dream. And the doctor says, Oh, very good. Like uh, if you're paying attention through all the noise in the living room, you've just got the plot, but you don't know how, right? It doesn't even matter if you know it's a dream. Um, so, okay. So how does the doctor get sucked into the dream? How does the dream crab do it? Well, uh, it's got to provide more mystery, I think, to get the doctor sucked in. Like, mm. there's got to be something maybe in that Danny Pink dream within a dream within a dream that, that like, takes him one dream level lower. Like, maybe mm. there's yeah. he gets into that house and River is all, also there. 
Right. And, and he's got he can have a last Christmas with River because we've not gone to the you know the final the yeah, yeah. yeah. So he might be missing River. Um so the only question on my mind is like would would the doctor regenerate if his brains are turned into soup? Does he become Jody? Oh wow, that's a good question. I don't know. Cuz it's kind of like you wouldn't have any storage anymore presumably, right? So maybe not. Mm. Yikes, could be real dead dead. Dead dead. Um so yeah, Dang. that's your point. The dream crab stuff is that everybody do- somehow doesn't get out. There's too many layers to it. Um that's pretty straightforward. There's maybe two other evil plots we can think about. The one of them I think might be Clara's where <laughs> it's not evil, but just being not having the willpower to get out of the dream, which yeah. almost happens. Right. So she kind of hugs Santa at the end and she just, you know, wants to stay a little longer because she likes her fantasy men and she wants to, she loves the exhilaration of just being there. Right. And so, right because the doctor was just loving it just a couple minutes earlier and getting to ride Santa's sleigh. So maybe um, because of that, somehow it draws the doctor in. I don't know. Somehow she just never gets out of it. Yeah. Well, well then, um, then you've got to posit a whole different season nine, right? Yeah. Uh, with, without Clara, without her dying and face the Raven. If she, if she dies here or she gets old here, um, but it's sort of, you know, we, we, we didn't really mention the, the getting old thing. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's my other either evil plot, which is Moffat's yeah. like he successfully <laughs> ditches Jenna Coleman, uh, by making her really old, mm. which I, if that had been the ending, um, it would have been really bittersweet, right? Yeah. Because not only does it, uh, feel like you're cheating, uh, the character out of something, you're kind of cheating uh, the fans out of something. Like it, yeah. it, it, I know anyone can write their way out of anything, but it would seemingly dismiss any possibility of her even returning to the show. I'm not yeah. saying like, you couldn't do it, but which it, doesn't it, make yeah. internal sense in that scene because we know that the doctor sees Clara as young. So what would, yeah. So what? So she needs help pulling a cracker. So what? She could still travel in the TARDIS. Yeah. Like, why, why would the doctor preclude that option? You know, justice well, for 82 year old Clara. Yeah, I thought about this cause it's true. He's trying to have his cake and eat it too in that scene. And it doesn't quite work because he does sort of break character in a sense at one point and say, you know, I'm sorry, I should have come back earlier. Um, and well, yeah, like to your point, why? And I guess you have to sort of headcanon it by saying, well, he's aware of human lifespans, even though he doesn't mm-hmm. sort of see age in the same way. So he knows she doesn't have much time left um, and she's probably weaker. So, Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I don't know, like there's a thing about the, he just doesn't travel with elderly people that much, you know, people are the uh, back half of their life. And I think we could deconstruct that for a minute in that he clearly wants to keep sort of recapturing this youthful energy. It's how he lives Mm -hmm. his life. He's an adventurer, and he wants to see that wonder reflected back in the people he takes with him. And I think that's not a bad thing. I think he's sort of self-aware about it. Um, but it, it is kind of one of those things where a character like old Clara gets, yes, is, isn't really treated that well in that, that kind of, uh, dynamic. Yeah. Uh, Maybe know. this is what Mrs. Flood is, is here to, uh, to fix uh, sort of the, all this, anti old companion thing maybe she's actually a rejected uh companion <laughs> because of her age <laughs> that, that might turn out to be the secret well the other thing is that maybe started. he's still feeling bad about what he put amy through mm. as the girl who waited so he's sort Ooh. of might have felt bad that he's doing it again yeah and also the the amy reference of like you know it, it would bring up you know, if if the ending stuck with old Clara, it would bring up the same problem we had with Amy and Rory disappearing, and like somehow the Doctor can never visit them again, right? Even right, though they exactly. lived long old lives, so he can never go back in their timeline. What? Why? Mm-hmm. Reasons? Yeah, reasons. Well, we got to find reasons for something else, and that is the place where the Clara Splinter is. <laughs> 
that didn't yeah. quite work. Anyway, we're trying to find where the Clara Splinter is because, of course, Clara Oswald was splintered in time at the end of the name of the Doctor. She's somewhere in every single Doctor Who story. And we have to imagine she's even splintered forward from that story into yeah. all of the future adventures. And this is one of them with Clara in it. Where is she in so, Last Christmas? i got to imagine that there's another Clara somewhere in in London or somewhere you know close by where where the doctor is and she's just kicking back on Christmas Day uh, with a Costco sized box of anti dream crab spray um, or maybe here's what what else we're going to theorize she's standing by with psychic pollen if if the doctor ah. gets too sucked in she can just throw some psychic pollen to the doctor reawaken the dream lord who aggravates the doctor enough for him to realize that he's dreaming to get out of the dream crab thing. Um, mm. And, uh, but yeah, so she's, she's standing by with, with the uh, dream crab, crab spray, but also she knows on some level, as we know on some level, the doctor kind of needs this. This is kind of a pivot yeah. point between the two versions of Capaldi's doctor, right? When he comes back after this, he's Lucy goosey. He's Dr. Disco. He's playing an electric guitar. His exactly. hair is longer. Like it's, there's something about being on the sleigh with Santa that really reawakens Capaldi's inner child. Agreed. There's even the scene earlier, like when he basically ditches the base cause he doesn't know it's a dream yet. Mm. And that, to me, feels almost like the last vestige of Series 8 Capaldi. Like, he's really extra mean in that scene, where he's like, mm. whatever, I'm not your mom, and there's lots of dangerous things on Earth, Clara. It just seems, mm. you know, Moffat just got the last bit of that out of his system, because it's, yeah. it's pretty nuts, and honestly a little out of character that he's just whatever. It's a little out of character, character, because it's supposed that the pivot point is supposed to be at the end of Death in Heaven, where he realizes, I'm just an idiot with a box. Mm. I'm not a good man. I'm not a bad man. I'm just an idiot with a box. That's supposed to be the pivot, but now he seems to be pivoting. He needs that little bit extra. He needs Santa. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I don't really have anything better than that. Other than somehow the Clara splinter fills in the gap of the collateral damage. And mm. I think the only way that works is honestly, if there's an entire other episode where <laughs> Cl Splinter Clara sees the doctor already taken by the dream crab. Yeah. Tries to help him, but then a whole bunch of other dream crabs sort of start closing in on her. She's yeah. forced to run. They're Ooh. pursuing her somehow. And maybe she even uses the TARDIS here. I don't know. Cause clearly she's found him at the volcano or something. So she's got to somehow get away and she gets away, but the crabs are nearly on her. She encounters herself on some, street in london you know and mm. barely gets away like out of sight so that she doesn't notice herself but the crabs then mistake real clara mm. like clara of this time for her yes. and think they've got her and then the other ones spread out from there for wherever she was and maybe she was in a shop and tried on some perfume and those all yeah. those people are just the closest people I love uh, they, it. they all get followed home and there you have it and that that's your lake Oh, that, no that's that's the one that's a winner okay. uh yes <laughs> dream dream uh dream crab clara just unexpectedly sharing crabs um let's not go too far down that road <laughs> but <laughs> yeah yeah well, I, want, I want someone to write the untold tales of the clara splinters and <laughs> turn that into an episode because it sounds kind of cool yeah, normally we'd say uh, RTD call us on this one because I really want to see that that backstory. But of course, we uh, we know from uh, certain writers on Doctor Who, <coughs> Terry Nation, that uh, you you own the rights to the monsters you create. So we we'll, we'll have to say Moffat call us for this Dream mm. Crab sequel. <laughs> awesome. Well, folks, it is time for the final question, the ultimate question, the only question that matters for last Christmas. What did we think of this story? The Bolt to Open rating system has six ratings. There's the Dalek, which we give to a good episode of Doctor Who. The Ogron, which we give to an irredeemably bad episode of Doctor Who. The Professor Hater, which we give to a not-so-great episode, but hey, at least we learned something. At least they tried something. The Viscount Banger, which we reserve for the best of the best. 
The Fixed Point in Time, which is a show beyond rating, usually for reasons of nostalgia, or The Lady Cassandra, which is a paper-thin plot, but hey, at least it looks good, especially with a little moisturizing. Okay, what do we got here? Well, Paint. listen, I can do it. Are oh, you going to do it? Do it. Paint, mate, mate, it's Easter week. It's a perfectly heartwarming and terrifying Christmas story that you can watch anytime. Who are you going to call? Who is that arriving in his well-appointed aristocratic sleigh? Could it be Santa Banger? <laughs> Father Banger? Father Banger. <laughs> it's No, it's a Viscount Banger. No question. Yeah. It's Full sledge on. and it's sledge. I I honestly wasn't sure. So listen, I saw I I watched this with my kids, and often I think if you've heard me talk about them before, you you probably think they've influenced my ratings. They probably do, and often mm-hmm. for the better because my kids, you know, they're kids and they like things and they like their show. And um, it's a good show. Well, in this case, they I think they might have done the opposite in that I wasn't. I wanted to sort of think this was a banger going in but i wasn't quite sure because their response was a little muted and they hadn't seen it before we actually uh-huh. hadn't watched this one at christmas um so i wasn't sure if this is just a really good dalek i don't <laughs> know and i honestly wanted to wait until we had discussed it um because i was leaning to a banger but i wasn't i wanted to not just hear your opinion but sort of get some stuff out of myself Mm. You know, I had to look into my own dream state, if you will. <laughs> yes, you have to go many and layers deep. Realize it, and I have to say, I think it's a really good mare. Which <laughs> is to say, yes, it's a it's a banger. It's hey, a banger. I mean, it's just like you say. He he did the impossible here. Like have mm-hmm. have Santa be in Doctor Who, not just make it work, but make it be really good. Have a heart to the show that really gets you. And just so much fun at the same time. Uh, and at and the I same kind of, time, I mean, you, know, you mentioned the horror stuff too. How did you, yeah. how does he do it? Yeah. <laughs> how does, he, how does he pivot like that? Yeah. I, I really think that, that he made deal with the devil in this episode. Well, you know, he yeah, had, pivoting between all these things. He had a second sledge. <laughs> yeah, we, we've we've not mentioned which I was going to pull it out if you if you were wavering on the Dalek versus Banger thing. I was going to hit you with how does how does he get all the presents in the sleigh? The moment of Santa just hold holding the cup of coffee and looking at the doctor like the smug look on his face, and he just says bigger on the inside, and the elves go ooh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I could watch that scene over and over. My God, like the doctor getting his come up and like that. Oh, it's it's so beautiful. It really yeah. is. So yeah, I'm glad we've got a we got a double banger here. We've got two dream viscounts. That's true. And now it is time for you, dear listener, to give your viscount or whatever rating you choose yeah. for last Christmas. Is it a Dalek Ogron, Professor Hader, Viscount Banger, Fixed Point in Time, or Lady Cassandra? You have your voice. Just go to the Spotify app and vote in our poll, and we will report the results on a future podcast. Right. That's right. And if you are a dream crab listening to this, then please do write in, because, you know, we, we know that this this episode might seem a little bit racist. Um, so, so to, not just Elfist, but also racist to dream crabs. Like, you know, write in, tell us why why these dream crabs should be uh, viewed a little more, uh, little more yeah. uh, you know, kind of uh, nicely. Or at least given more roomy containers. Yeah, you know? I know, right? No wonder that one bust out. All right, folks. Uh, by the way, if you want full notes on this episode and all of our episodes, please subscribe to our newsletter at pulltoopen.net. Uh, you will get all kinds of original thoughts. And even if you we might not have gotten to during the podcast, so it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, you can also support the podcast on Patreon at patreon.com slash pull to open that's in addition to youtube where you will of course get the podcast again a day early at youtube.com slash pull to open if you join and become a true companion by that's right by that's right a membership open your presence on pull to open eve and yes we thank you for the equivalent of tangerines <laughs> uh, that you are delivering. By the way, are tangerines uh, associated with Santa in the U.S.? I, I generally don't know this. Yeah, you got the um, little Christmas oranges. That's what they generally call yeah, them, like the yeah, little oranges. Christmas oranges. Okay. Yeah. Everybody yeah. likes the tangerines. By the way, 
By the way, we we, need appeal. (laughs) Yeah, I love tangerines. What are you talking about, Doctor? Yeah, Mm -hmm. and and also I got to say, maybe the Clara Splinter. We didn't mention this. The tangerine at the very end. Maybe she's the one responsible for putting it there. So Mm -hmm. the perfect ambiguity of whether or not Santa exists is restored. She could be, although she could, if it, even if it is her, maybe she's married to Santa. Maybe she's Mrs. <gasps> Claus. Clara is Mrs. Claus. There we go. There's the big finish series. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I love it. All right. All right. Well, Stop us before we get more plot lines out yes. of last Christmas, it's time to get into our own TARDIS and figure out where we are going next by activating the randomizer. That's right. Pausing only to readjust the entirety of Doctor Who canon in our heads, we step towards the center console. We activate the randomizer. Pete is on one side of the console. He's flipping some switches that bring up the codex on the monitor. The codex is our list of all Doctor Who stories. In sequential order, it only has the ones that we haven't done. Pete, how many face huggers do we still have to attach to our faces? <laughs> Well, after knocking out last Christmas here, we are at 188. That's it. Last Christmas turns to ash before our eyes. We we uh, lose the ice cream headache and we have 188 stories left to go. I plug those numbers into random.org, which is over on my side of the console. That is the executor. That is the bit that actually gives you proper randomness from atmospheric noise and psychic pollen and dream crabs and Santa sleighs in the atmosphere bouncing around up there. So the maximum number is 188. The minimum number is one. And before I hit that generate button, we'd like to give the randomizer some challenges. And I'm going to go first because I discovered all of these other Easter based stories. Um, We we haven't done any of them. Wow. Um, Yeah. So let's get a little bit closer to an Easter mention bingo by taking us to one of these other easter referencing stories that's cool getting eggy with it um it's <laughs> a bit of an easter egg you might say ah there so as i was saying um i think this might have convinced the randomizer that Stephen moffat is its favorite showrunner mm. and if that has happened now that it's indulged itself uh, and some of the some of the great writing that he's done, maybe you will stop being so scared of the Matt Smith era <laughs> randomizer. And then we currently the biggest gap we have in our codex that we have not done. So a big ocean exists between dinosaurs on a spaceship and the day of the Doctor. There are mm. uh, twelve stories in between. So everything from a tra- town called Mercy to the name of the Doctor. It's the biggest gap in a codex. Um, and I would like to see us go there. Just wow. Something that is Matt Smithy. Uh, well, there, that means that there are really four options where it could please both of us. 11th Ooh. Hour, Girl Waited, True. and Possible Astronaut, Time of the Doctor, all, ha- all have Easter references and our Matt Smith stories that we haven't done. Um, and, yeah, we could also do a shooty or we, sh- we could do a David Tennant. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's see. Let's find me- out. Give me a countdown. We'll, a we'll we'll bigger Venn diagram than I suspected there. Let's do it. Uh, here we go. Four, three, two, one. All right. Oh, my goodness. Our next really good mare is 182. Oh, we missed. But we are all the way up to. Oh, no. 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 Did it do it? Did it. It did it. Flux. Flux. Oh, that's a lot of TV. <laughs> that's that's a lot of TV. That's more TV we worked out in a past episode than the Daleks' master plan. Well, here's the thing, and I'm going to get a little meta with this. Yes, please. <laughs> last Christmas, it gets meta. You, the last choice was scary for the ran made you scared of the randomizer. <laughs> this one's got me terrified because. You know, we 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 work hard to get new content every week to you guys, and we're about uh, to go on a two week. I'm not going to call it a vacation now. <laughs> it was a vacation. We, we're going to take two weeks off recording, yeah. and uh, it's <laughs> in, in a way, it's kind of the ideal time to get flux, right? Because we've got a little time. 
I wasn't going to mention it, but in my head was like, take us to the Daleks master plan because this would actually be a good time to do it. <laughs> um, but yeah. So here we go. Well, I'm really looking forward to watching this very long Doctor Who story. I did the math before when we did, I think, the War Games uh, on how many minutes it is. I uh, can't dig that up right this second. But I'm, I, honestly, I'm really looking forward to checking it out while not drunk. <laughs> but you know what it's this what this means is it's all downhill from here we will never again watch more doctor who than we have watched for this and i think actually the the calculation that we need to do is whether flux is longer than all the cold opens put together that we watched for our cold open side trip that was supposed mm. to be a short trip so yeah <laughs> that would yeah. be an interesting calculation to do that is oh honestly now i just i just found the minutes that i did the math and yes. I did it the precise counts of all of the episodes together it is the yeah. longest story if how you many blocks all is one it's 323 minutes the oh, dollar mastermind with cow. mission to the unknown is 316 this is it. This is the big one. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at war. <laughs> <laughs> one Jack Nark Tarkus would say, you can come and see the results of that war, everyone. All you have to do is head on back to pull to open, which in your time might be next week or in a couple of weeks. Uh, but in our time is going to be in the future. And you can, of course, follow us at pull to open or pull to open 63 on any of the social networks we are at. And we're looking forward to checking out how the universe contends with losing a lot of itself. Indeed. Uh, and we will have the Doctor's first full-on Liverpudlian companion, which is a true Liverpudlian I'm very excited about. It's going to be fantastic, folks. See you then. <laughs>